Welcome to Forming the Spirit Within, a teaching ministry of Pastor Brad Riley. Pastor Brad is an associate and teaching pastor at First Church of the Nazarene here in Wichita, Kansas. He is the founder and director of the Merciful Servants of Christ, as well as the author of numerous articles. And now, here's Pastor Brad. I walked in three minutes early and I'm starting five minutes late. What does that say? I've wasted the last eight minutes writing on the board and talking about the pre, pre-class notes that I've been giving you. Well, if you have your prayer cards, let's pray before we study Scripture together. <laughs> Illumine our hearts, O Master, lover of all humanity, with the pure light of your divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may understand your gospel teachings. Implant deep within us the fear of your blessed commandments that through them we may conquer all carnal desires and may be transformed to live, both thinking and doing, the things that are pleasing to you. For you, O Lord, are the light of our souls and bodies, and unto you we give all glory and praise, together with our Father, who is from everlasting and the all-holy, good, and life-creating Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, last week, last week we had a um, of the prayer card. Yes, yeah, so you can keep that with you in your Bible. There you go. Last week we had some deep discussion on the church, the nature of the church, uh, because I wanted to digress and bring that to you because it's so critical to our understanding of what Jesus is doing here in this last night of his life as he's pouring out his last words to his apostles. I'll just call them that. They haven't been sent yet, but they're about to be. Um, his disciples, his apostles, he's, he's pouring out things from his heart. They're not quite understanding. They're not quite getting, but they will soon. And and we, we, so we only covered the first few verses like... Uh, 12 through 15 or so last week. We had read the whole section up through 22. Um, but uh, the reason I, I digressed a little was because I wanted you to get a, a hold of what Jesus means when he says that the spirit of the truth is coming and that spirit of truth is going to guide you, my apostles, into all truth. And we have no doubt that he did, that he guided Peter, James, and John, and Thomas, and Bartholomew and, and all of those others into the truth. But the truth is those men only lasted a couple of decades, most of them, and they were martyred and killed. And where did that truth go? Well, I believe it was deposited into who they were. They were and still are in, in, a, in a living way uh, foundation of the church. The Apostle Paul says that in the book of Ephesians. I believe it's chapter one. He says, you've been built on the foundation of the apostles. He says to the Ephesian Christians, you've been built on the foundation of the apostles of the church, which is the apostle of which Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. It's very popular for us Protestants today to say, oh, we're just founded on the Bible, we're founded on the New Testament, we're founded on Jesus. Yes, we are, all of that's true, but don't ignore what Jesus himself said, that the ministry of the apostles, the teaching ministry of the apostles, was the core of delivering this message of Christianity to the whole world. And they couldn't reach the whole world in their short lifetime, so it had to continue. And it's continuing up into this very present day because we still haven't reached the whole world with the gospel, have we? We've translated it into an awful lot of languages, but there are still people who do not know the gospel. And uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is what empowered them to do that. The indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, which we'll see at Pentecost, that same Holy Spirit that is available to you and I when we surrender our hearts, and seek that infilling, that indwelling, uh, that same spirit who guided the truth, of, guided the church of the apostles in truth, has to be the same spirit who guides the church of today in truth. The challenge is when we look at the church and we see 
so many different factions of the church. The Lutherans don't agree with the Presbyterians, and the Presbyterians and the Lutherans together don't agree with the Catholics, and, and the Mennonites don't agree with the Lutherans and the Presbyterians, and the Methodists don't agree with any of those, and so on and so on and so on. It almost sounds like a genealogy. You know, so-and-so begat so-and-so. But said, instead of begatting a family, they're begatting disunity. You know, what do we do with that? What do we do with the fact that we're inheritors? We're now living 500 years after the Reformation, and what we're inheriting in our lifetime is a very disunified church. Well, there has to be unity, because the truth is there can only be one church. The Apostle Paul says that very clearly also in Ephesians when he says there's one Lord, one faith, one body, one baptism, you know. Um, And so what do we do with that? Well, we do well to know the creed. That's why I handed those out to you again. Because those early church fathers in about the year 325 A.D., after about 200 years of Christian teaching and preaching and spreading and founding churches around the known world at that time, there were all kinds of issues. Teachings creeping in that weren't part of the true gospel, that didn't line up with the teachings of the apostles. And and so they were constantly trying to... to, to draw people back to the center. Well, what's the center? You know, in our day, we want to say, well, it's the New Testament. But they didn't quite have the New Testament, you see. They had letters of Paul, and they had letters over here of Peter. They had letters of John over there. But they weren't unified, and they weren't bound up in scrolls. And there wasn't a, on every pulpit, in every church, in every living room, there wasn't a Bible, so to speak, okay? It wasn't until the very end of the third century I mean, the 4th century, sorry, I get my three, the late 300s. In the, I believe it's the year 391. I could be off a couple of years on that. There was a council called the Council of Carthage in which there was proposed the very list of 27 books that we call the New Testament and ratified and approved, if you will. Well, that's a long time since Jesus' day, and it's a long time since the 1st century when those books were written because they were all written by the end of the 1st century. So... You know, there's a couple hundred years of the, the Holy Spirit guiding the church without a New Testament, without a Bible on every pulpit. What's going on in there in those years? How can we understand those years? It, it, it's just not enough. It wasn't enough for me. Maybe it's enough for you, and that's okay if it is. Okay, It wasn't enough for me as a Christian trying to study God's Word and study His church and to be drawn as deeply as I could into that church, that mystical body of Christ. It was not enough for me to just say, oh, I've got my New Testament. I'm living in the 21st century. I'm okay. I want to make sure I'm living, breathing, thinking like Christ wanted the church to live and breathe and think. And so, therefore, I had to find that connection. And that connection is this Nicene Creed. Um, As we... Look at it. I handed it out to you. Some of you have had it a long time. Some of you maybe read it every now and then. It's part of my it's part of my daily life. Okay, part of my routine in my prayer class that I gave. Those those which by the way they're all on the podcast. The unlocking the mystery of prayer. And one of those weeks I shared my ritual of prayer that I go through every day. I call it a prayer rule. Okay, if you don't have any rules, what do you have? You have chaos. Okay, so you need a rule in your life. And my rule is to pray a certain way every day. And that way takes me through prayers of praising God and thanking God and interceding for others and petitioning him for things. And as part of my affirmation of faith, one of the things that's part of that is, is, is this creed, because it is the oldest statement of what it means to be Christian. And so um, just look at it with me this morning. Let's just look at it real briefly here before we continue. We're going to continue on in John, but... But briefly, this kind of rounds out our discussion about the church, okay, last week that we had. So the creed says, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. Okay, that's the first statement. That's the first section of the creed. We believe in God and he's the maker of all things. Okay, whether you can see him or not, that's him. Then it moves to the second section. And, you could say, and I believe, but the original, this is actually translated from the original Greek. 
some churches and some liturgy prayer books or services, you'll hear it maybe just a couple of different, may say, we believe. I think it's best prayed individually. I believe. This is what I believe. Okay. And I'm making a statement. So uh, the second section says, and in one Lord. There's only one Lord. His name is Jesus Christ. Okay. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. That word begotten is critical. That begotten does, it says begotten, Son of God. Begotten from the Father before all ages. Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. What they're saying is Jesus Christ existed before all time. Somehow in the mystery of the Godhead, he's begotten, he's out there, but he's not made. Because that's the heresy that fought the church that tried to drag us away that was called Arianism that said Jesus was just the created son of God. You know, Jehovah's Witness believe that today. But even back in those days, there were heresies, wrong teachings about who Jesus was. He is eternally existent of the Father before all worlds, in other words. So he goes on to teach about Jesus. It says, who of one, he said, begotten, not made. And then it says, of one substance with the Father. The Greek word here is homoousius. You recognize that word homo for mankind, okay, of homo, homo sapien, okay. Homoousius in the Greek means of the same being. So what is the creed telling us? Jesus and God the Father are one, okay? They're one, somehow mystery, they're one. Of the same being and essence of the Father, in other words, okay. Through whom all things came into existence, Everything came into existence through Jesus Christ, who is God, along with the Father. Great mystery. And was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man. This is the high point of all Christian faith. In fact, in very, very high, rich liturgical services, they will stop at that point for a moment of silence, maybe even bow, and became man. God, God from before all creation came into our existence, took on human flesh and became man. Whoa, <laughs> that kind of feeling, okay? That's what they're writing here. Became man, God became man. So the creed's specific. Yes, she was a virgin. Yes, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. These are things you must believe to be traditionally understood as Christian, okay? Um. And became man. Okay. Now, and was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. And he suffered and he was buried. In other words, he died. Okay. And rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And ascended to heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. And will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. Of whose kingdom there will be no end. That right there, from the, from the line that says, in one Lord Jesus Christ, to the kingdom will have no end, that's the, the biggest part of the creed is all about Jesus. Those are the definitive statements for Christians to teach about who and what Jesus Christ is. Okay. Then the, the creed transitions to talk about the Holy Spirit. So it says, and in the Holy Spirit. The Lord and giver of life. Now, everything that we just read, I'm sorry, I didn't stop there, but after whose kingdom will have no end, that's where the creed ended in 325. At the great council of Nicaea in 325 AD, that's where the creed ended. But there were some challenges through these decades that they needed to come back and redefine better who the Holy Spirit is as well. Okay. So that's why this last part was added in the year 381. I put the dates up at the top. And in the Holy Spirit. What do they mean by and? Everything we just said about God, we believe. Everything we just said about Jesus, we're now, now we're saying and we believe also about the Holy Spirit. Okay, and in the Holy Spirit. And we believe, or I believe in the Holy Spirit, who is the Lord and giver of life. It's very important that they called him Lord. Jesus is Lord too. And in one Lord Jesus, they get the same title. In other words, they're saying the Holy Spirit is God. 
Okay. Three, three persons, one being. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the Lord and giver of life. Who proceeds from the Father? We just studied that a couple of weeks back in John chapter 16. I will send, I will ask the Father, and he will send you the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father, okay? That's the part that got changed. In all Western, in almost all Western Christian churches, when I say Western Christian, I mean either Roman Catholic or Protestant, okay? If you grew up hearing this or or ever, it says, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Well, guess what? And the Son's not on there. That's an addition. The, 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 medieval, the medieval year 6th century Roman Catholic Church in the west of Europe added that phrase, and the Son, into the creed. They didn't do it in council with the agreement of all the eastern bishops and everyone else in the world. It was done in Spain in the Council of Toledo by just a local Spain and the western church. They did it for good intentions. They were trying to teach that Jesus is really God. Um, and that the Holy Spirit is really God, and that it proceeds from both. But what they were doing was messing with something they didn't have any business to mess with. If you're going to change the creed, you need to do it all together, because this is the definitive statement of church and Christ, okay? Just like if we want to change the Nazarene manual, we can't just go change it, can we? What do we have to do? have to petition the General Assembly, have to be met at General Assembly, has to be debated at General Assembly, has to be finally voted on at General Assembly, has to be ratified, you see. You can't just change it because you want to. That created a big rift in Christian history because the Eastern Christians from about the 6th century to the middle millennium began to tell the West, you can't do that. And it changed the way they identified with one another. And it really ultimately ended in a split in 1054. Um, There's way more to it that we don't have time for that. But I just wanted you to know that's not part of the original creed. So who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. In other words, the Holy Spirit is God too. Worship him just not some demigod, but God, fully God. Who spoke through the prophets. In other words, the Holy Spirit spoke through the prophets. And now here's the fourth part of the creed. So we started with the definitive statements about God, Father, definitive statements about the Lord Jesus Christ, and definitive statements about the Holy Spirit and where he comes from. And now, finally, definitive statements about the church. And in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. This is in the year 381 AD. They're saying there is only one church. It's universal. There can only be one church. And it's apostolic in that it has been passed down to us from the teachings of the apostles. Okay. We do confess one baptism to the remission of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to the life of the world to come. Okay. That's the definitive statement known as the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. And the reason I wanted to bring that to you again, some of you asked for it, But this idea we're talking about, as we did last week, there is only one church. Okay. Yeah, I do, actually. Yeah, I've got several of them here. Okay, here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. There you go. So, before we just jump right back in here, I I just want to, if you want to go back and listen to last week's, I went back and listened to it just because I wanted to be clear on what I said. Not sure I ever communicate as fully as I want to communicate. Jesus is depositing, through the Holy Spirit, the gift of truth to the apostles. Do you remember, in the, we just read in, in, John's, in the earlier verses, how Jesus, uh, no, we haven't read it yet. And when we get to John chapter 20, which we're not there yet, obviously. When we get to John chapter 20, Jesus is going to appear to them on the night of the resurrection in the upper room, and it says he breathed upon them. Do you kind of remember that? John chapter 20. And he breathed upon them, and he said, Receive the, these are Jesus' words. He said, Receive the Holy Spirit and breathed upon them. The Holy Spirit of God is the breath of life. In the book of Genesis, it said, God breathed into the human, that lump of clay, the breath of life. Okay. 
He breathed on them and received the Holy Spirit. And then he said, whosoever sins you retain, whosoever sins you forgive shall be forgiven. To the 11 that are in the room there. And whosoever sins you retain shall be retained. Now we don't have time to go into what all that means, but clearly the early church believed and the apostles functioned and believed that they had been given a commission from Jesus Christ to hear people confess their sins and to offer them Jesus' forgiveness, not their own, as human beings. Okay? Or, if they didn't feel they were really contrite or sorrowful, to say, eh, can't, can't, can't offer you a blessing here. I don't believe you're really forgiven. So that, that's, that's a, again, this is stuff that we find in the early historic church that sometimes we Protestants haven't studied and so we don't understand it. But that's right there out of Scripture, okay? It's not some... So this idea of why do Catholics have confession... Now, there may be some things I disagree with in Catholic confession, and there are. But the concept of confession isn't wrong. It's actually very scriptural. Okay. Um, so I just want you to hear, this is, again, it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's only in the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit that they can offer those kinds of words of guidance and affirmation, uh, things like that, through the to the sinners. Uh, now... When we come back to this thought about the, church, the deposit of truth, the teachings of the 12 apostles, it wouldn't have been nice if they had just written everything down that Jesus ever said and just left it in a book for all of us, and there would be no question, right? Wouldn't that have been nice? Well, at the end of, book, of the book of John, it says if they tried to do that, that it, it would filled all the space in the world. That's right. That's right. There's just too much there, okay? So that's why we know that God has to be with the church. If it is the church, if the church is truly the church of Jesus Christ, God is with them in the Holy Spirit. And it's not teaching things that are counterproductive to that creed. Okay, we have distinctives about the church of the Nazarene. Every every it seems like every little denomination has their own distinctives, okay? But the essence of who we are is right there on that card. Okay. We, we don't teach anything that objects to that card. Um, now, as we come back, let's come back to the Gospel of John. Here, here's what I want to hear. I want to bring one more other scripture. I want you to look up the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. Again, we're going to appeal. Last week we looked at Timothy and we looked at Ephesians and we looked at the Apostle Paul's thinkings about the church. Okay. And... Uh, so I put on the note here, we're, we're talking, what we're really talking about in John 16 here is the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. What was it then? What is it today? Where was it then? Where is it today? Okay. Well, we know that the scripture said it was in the church. We saw that last week in Ephesians 3.10 especially. We know that it's the apostles, as we just heard earlier from the book of Ephesians. It's the, the foundation of the church is the apostles. Um, but what's this thing called tradition? What do we do with that? Okay, I put it on the board on purpose. Because like I said, wouldn't it have been nice if they'd just written everything down and handed it down to us? And we have no debate, no argument. Read, uh, Mark, do you have it there? Yeah. Can you read verse 15? This is chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians. The apostle Paul is writing, giving advice to the church. Okay, this is the NASB version. Okay. <clears throat> Listen up, everybody. This is good. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Okay. First of all, Paul is saying there's a problem, or he wouldn't be writing this. He's telling them to stand firm because they're attempting to waver. Okay. But what is he telling them to stand firm to? The traditions. The traditions that who taught them? He? Did he say that I taught you? No, he said that we taught you. Who's we? The apostles. Okay? Clearly the apostles were teaching some things that were not written down in the scriptures that we have in our hands. He says that were given to you by letter? Or what? Mouth. By mouth or by letter. There's clearly an oral teaching by mouth, an oral teaching of the apostles 
that has credence and power and truth behind it, not just the letter, like Thessalonians or Romans or one of these letters, meaning the book. Well, what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Where is that tradition? Would you believe me if I told you there is a book? Would you believe me if I told you there's a book? Maybe it doesn't contain everything, but it does contain a lot. There's a book that's called the... Let me write it on the board. Okay, it's got a Greek name. The Didache. D-I-D-A-C-H-E. The Didache in Greek. Anybody ever heard of that book? You can Google it. It's online. You can read it all you want. You know what that book is? It's, you know what the, the translated name is that was given? The Teachings of the Twelve Apostles. Oh, wow. Okay? This book, we don't even know who the author is. We just know it was written down in the early, very early second century to maybe late first century of the era of this idea that the apostles are passing on traditions, maybe... You know, they know they're going to die and they're passing them on to the people they've ordained and so on and so on. The Didache. Go look it up on Google. Print it out. Read it. Or just read it. It's not all that long. It's not like you're, you know, it's not this, you'd think, again, it'd be so big. Again, it's not exhaustive of everything that was ever done. But it gives us a lot. It gives us a lot of things about how to run a church. It actually functions almost like a church manual, if you will. It tells you how to baptize people. Tells you how to do communion. Tells you a lot of things that, quite frankly, we don't even follow. <clears throat> and we get, and when, we, when we scratch our heads and go, why don't we baptize like that? I say, well, I don't know. Maybe because there were 1,900 years between this and nobody had read it when we started the Church of the Nazarene. And we were just trying to follow what we had. And what we have is the New Testament. And the New Testament is good. I'm not saying the New Testament's not good, and I'm not saying the New Testament's not authoritative. I'm just saying there's a fullness to the faith that we want to be sure we're embracing, okay? And to not be afraid of what, to go back and look into history and study the early church. You know, that's what happened when all these, at some point in the 20th century, okay, at the turn of the 20th century, what happened was there were a lot of people that were disenfranchised with the church, churches, and they were trying to get back to the original. That's what everybody wanted. You heard that all the time. Oh, we just want to be a New Testament church. That's what we want to be. We want to be a New Testament church. Well, what was a New Testament church? I mean, you got to read this to figure out what a New Testament church was, because this was what was guiding the New Testament church, the decay. So. You know, actually says that you have to baptize people in cold running water. <laughs> I kind of like the warm baptismal when I get in there to people. I've been in the Jordan River and baptized there, and trust me, it's cold and running. Okay. <laughs> but we also know that the Greeks have a word that's called economia. Okay. It also goes then, economia, which means in the economy of God, you have to. Consider, be considerate. You know, we're not trying to be legalists here. It goes on to say, if you don't have cold running water, you need to bat, and it says to dip people, to immerse them. But if you don't have, then do this. And if you don't have, then do this. So there are an economia. There is an opportunity for you. If you can't have it perfectly, have it this way. You know what I'm saying? It's not a legalistic thing. So maybe there's an economia for us to have warm water in our baptisms. Because the early church baptized them naked, too, and I don't want to do that either. <laughs> okay, so uh, yes, they did. I don't, uh, and you can you can argue you can argue and say naked meant they had their underwear on, you know, which is uh, which is arguably probably true of whatever underwear was in those days, uh, a wrapped cloth. But I don't want to do that, <laughs> and I don't want you to do that when you come to me to be baptized. So let's just remember, okay, that uh, why are we going through all this? Because Jesus said. When the spirit of truth comes, verse 13, he will guide you into all truth. Not most of it, not some of it, all of it. And he's not speaking of his own authority. He's hearing what the Father and I know. All of the Father's knowledge, all of Jesus' knowledge, is all of the Holy Spirit's knowledge. Okay, So therefore, 
as the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing where as human beings, the apostles were human men. They were limited by what they were able to understand. And as it was revealed to them, I looked it up and it's, it's, um, I looked it up in the, the scripture, I think is, is uh, I said last week on the tape, I, in the book of Acts, it wasn't the book of Acts. It's, it's in, uh, I think, Luke 12 and Matthew 10, where Jesus says, there's going to be a time where you're going to be called in front and you're going to be called out to, don't worry about what you'll say. He's talking about when they're out there as apostles and Jesus has already gone back into heaven. You're going to be called in front of the courts. You're going to be called in front of the people. And you do not need to worry because the Holy Spirit will give you what you're to say. As they were able to receive it, the Holy Spirit revealed it. Okay. Uh, and we're, we're very much bound by that. We're all bound by it. Just like right now, you might be scratching your head saying, I'm going to go back and have to listen to this again because I'm not receiving what you're saying, Brad. That's okay. It's okay. Took me years to figure some of this stuff out. Isn't it? It's not just stuff that, I, boom, opened a book and wow, oh yeah, that's the way it is, you know. But all truth is God's truth. Always remember that all truth is God's truth, and God has given His church through the ministry of the Holy Spirit all truth. Okay. You can't hear me no. in the back. Well, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm talking really loud. I'm sorry. Um, I feel like I'm shouting. I'm sorry. I'll do my best. Um, so let's move on here a little bit and look at what Jesus says to them at the last scriptures that we read last week, that last kind of 16 through 22. So what is tradition? We see that it's the teachings of the apostles. It does not contradict scripture. Part of the flaw of Western teaching, Western Christian teaching through the years is that uh, Protestants began to argue with Catholics once there was such a thing as Protestants that the Catholics were teaching things as tradition like it was the gospel truth and and it wasn't in scripture. Well, uh, and the medieval Catholic church honestly was teaching some things that weren't necessarily in scripture and those are why we have a reformation and why there were things that needed to be reformed. Okay. Now, I think some of those reforms went too far, but that's a whole other story. But uh, a whole other lesson, a whole other class, if you will. Um, but the, the point is, tradition, apostolic tradition, has to agree with Scripture. Because it's all the mind of the Holy Spirit, it's, or it's not real. There is, who is the Word? The Word isn't that printed page. The Word is Christ. The Logos of God, the Word of God. Remember the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. Jesus was the Word. He is the Word of God. And, and what he breathes through the, the Holy Spirit into these apostles, it is his Word. Okay, It must agree with his Word. So we know that everything was later written down as part of the New Testament, came to be accepted as part of the New Testament, is the Word of God. Because it's what... Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, inspired to be collected for us. So what I think Protestants do well is they say that the New Testament has within it everything necessary for salvation. Okay, there's no secret tradition that you've got to have that you can't find on the pages of the New Testament in order to be saved. And I don't know of a church that preaches that. If they do, they're, I would say they're wrong. Okay. Um, but what we have to be careful with, and what I brought to you last week was, we, because we think that sal the salvation message is, re is, is right there on the pages of your New Testament, that still doesn't mean you don't need the church. See, that's the problem. That's the conundrum. When did church become optional? Because the church is Jesus. It's his body. It's his mind in the Holy Spirit of Christ. We, we can't do without the church. And, and I don't think the evangelical world, I don't think much of the world understands that today. So, um, so then we come to the scriptures. And that's what we're reading. That's what we're studying here. Okay. So in the scripture, what are the scriptures? They're those, the 20, we're talking about New Testament right now, the 27 books that in the year 391 or whenever, 97 maybe, I don't remember what it was. It was before 400. The councils got together and said, this is it. This is the New Testament. This is what we're going to say. This is the canon. That's where the word canon comes in. You've heard of the canon of Scripture? Canon means list. 
Okay, the canon of scripture is the official list. Okay, now interestingly enough, they didn't at that council necessarily say what the Old Testament was. So there's always been some debate about that. And as we got into the Protestant Reformation, guys like Martin Luther started throwing out books from the canon of the Old Testament and arguing over those. So there's always been some debate about that. I, and I don't have, to have time to teach you on all that, but I will tell you this. The, uh, in my script, if you take my class on how to read the Bible for all it's worth, I go into all of that. How to read scripture for all it's worth is a class. I talk about the canon and what the Old Testament, why are those extra books, what they were thought of, and why they're there. Um, but for now, understand that the scriptures are the authority of God. They are the authority of God. But so is the tradition, because it's born of each other. There's a, there's a, there's a relationship here. They're born of each other. Okay? And in that scripture, we know that Jesus, God meant for the scripture to be in the fullness of his time. That means after about 400 years. God meant for there to be a New Testament. He guided the church fathers into saying, yes, let's use Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but let's definitely don't use the Gospel of Thomas because that book's nuts. Okay? He, 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 the Holy Spirit guided these church fathers. We wouldn't have a New Testament if it wasn't for guys like St. Athanasius and, and St. Irenaeus and all of these people who were guided over the years 200 to 400 to really guide the church and say, this is a good scripture, but that's not. Bishops would travel around to town to town and some guy would be preaching from the gospel of Peter and, and, and the bishop would say, I have to pull him aside and say, Brother, that wasn't right, what you were saying. And he says, well, I got the gospel of Peter right here. And he says, yeah, but that's not our gospel. So these are the type of things that were happening in the give and take of church development over a couple hundred years, you know, till we come down to these 27 books. It's pretty fascinating stuff, quite frankly. It's miraculous. God was guiding it all because he gave the spirit of truth and the revelation of it to his body, the church. And now we have the fruit of it. The fruit of it is the New Testament, which nobody really had even after 387. They didn't have it in large part until the printing press was invented, <laughs> you know, when people could actually start printing Bibles and start reading them. And even then, most people couldn't read. So the church had to tell them what the Scripture meant, you see? And so now when we think about the Scriptures, when we're, like we're trying to do here, we're going to say, well, what does this mean, John 16 through 16 through 22? What, what, is, what does any of this mean? Well, who am I, Brad Riley, to stand up here and tell you what I think it means? A, a guy with absolutely zero degrees on my wall in theology or history. Zero. I have no degrees in theology or history. All I have is a lifetime of reading and learning on my own. Okay? And trying to discover truth as it's revealed through these sources. So, and anything I teach you, I'm going to stand on it. I'm, I'm just standing on it because it's what I've discovered through this. But I don't believe I'm teaching anything that hasn't been taught by Christians for 2,000 years. Okay. Some of it might be a little new discovery for you, but that's okay. You know, we want, God didn't just wait till, like I said, 1908 to drop the right church into the world and call it the Church of the Nazarene. Just because Jesus was Nazarene, you know, I love that title, right? We're the Church of Jesus. We're the Church of the Nazarene. You know, no, 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 no. That's pride. That's arrogance. Okay. I love the Church of the Nazarene. I love our mission in the world to go make Christ-like disciples. You know, I love the way we think and teach and the way we connect ourselves to the ancient church. Um, but but to, in order to tell you what this, I believe this means, I've got to pray about it. And I can't just give you what I think. I've got to read. I've got to get, go back into the Greek language. And I've got to say, what did that mean? I've got to read some of these early Greek fathers, these early teachers, and even some Latin fathers like Augustine. And we've got to look and we've got to, we've got to struggle with the text and say, hmm. But I can tell you this. This is something else I teach in, in the scripture class. It can't mean something different today than it meant then. Because God doesn't change. You with me? That's real important. It cannot mean something different today than it did originally. Okay? 
God is unchanging. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? So, but the first thing we have to do is we have to figure out what did it mean then before we can understand what it means today. Okay? And that is where the struggle, that's where the study. Okay? So Peter is very careful. In the, the Apostle Peter, in his, I believe, is, is it his second epistle or his first epistle? can't remember now. He said, no scripture is of a private interpretation of man. Okay? This is where some of these TV preachers and different uh, eclectic personalities throughout history have gotten into trouble by telling you they heard from God. This is what this means. And then what they tell you doesn't even line up with what Scripture says. And for some reason, people follow them. I don't get that. You know, if I ever tell you something that I... But we can't prove from either scripture or the very historic tradition of the early church, then you call me out on it. And we'll sit down and we'll discuss it rationally and not argue with each other. We'll lovingly talk about it and see if we can discern truth. But man, there's an awful lot of kooks out there that have taught things that are just nuts, you know. Um, so I try not to do that. Let's look now. So there's a great promise. Here's the great promise we want to find today. Jesus Christ gave a great promise, several promises to his disciples that night, and therefore us as well. So let's look at it. In, uh, he, I'll just go ahead and read 16 to 22. We read it last week. Let's read it again. A little while and you will see me no more. And again, a little while and you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, what is this he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father, that's a reference to verse 9 earlier. And then verse 18, they said, what does he mean by a little while? We don't know what he means. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. And so he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves? You want you, what I mean by saying a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she is delivered of the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a child is born into the world. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Now, I'm smart enough not to preach and teach about pregnancy and childbirth, <laughs> because I have not endured it. Okay? And I realize the preponderance of this class is women. And the truth is, I watched it, though. I watched it. And, and, and I don't think, I don't know what it's like, okay? But all I know is that I'm thankful that for the gift of modern medicine. Because when we were having our first child, I should say when Rhonda was having our first child, she was in labor for 22 hours somewhere in that neighborhood, right? But once they gave her that, what's it called? Epidural, wow. She went from pain, anguish, to laying in bed on her side, laughing and talking. I went out and bought her some roses, you know, <laughs> snowing outside across the street. And we're sitting there having fun, you know. <laughs> push, you know, that sort of thing. Push to push. So I mean, am I telling the story right, Rhonda? It, it didn't hurt that bad when she had the epidural, right? But all through these 22 hours, there are women down the hallway screaming their heads off. I mean, unbelievable pain, anguish. And I remember the young doctor was, would say things like, well, they didn't get the epidural, or they got here too late, or some of them just don't want it. They want to do this natural thing. Like, you know, that's a, you know, they, they make fun of men with He-Man, you know, wanting to be so bravado and everything. But these, maybe some of you are the women that did it natural. I'm not putting you down. I'm saying, hey, wow, I'm impressed you did it. Okay, I'm very impressed. Sometimes people don't have the choice. Because they maybe get there too late or the you know, baby's born in a taxi cab or on a farm or wherever, you know. Um, 
But, but what I'm saying is, Jesus is comparing their anguish. Remember John 14? Let not your hearts be troubled. We've been in this last night with Jesus for a few chapters now. And they're in anguish. And they don't, they cannot, they're, they're troubled. They don't understand why he's going away. They don't understand anything. But Jesus is giving them a promise. And his promise is, I know you don't understand now. I know you're, and you're going to be hurting. Believe me, it wasn't fun for Peter to have to run, to have to stand there and, and, and uh, deny Jesus. He felt pretty bad about it, but he was scared for his life. You know, none of this stuff was fun. But he said, don't worry, your anguish. Just like when a woman's goes away, when the, when the baby comes, all of a sudden that pain ends. And there's such joy at this newborn baby. This life holding in your arms that was inside you, now it's outside of you. Wow, it's breathing on its own. This, this, this joy, that's where you're going to be in just a few days. See, they didn't know it, but it was only going to take three days. Jesus was in, you know, three parts of parts of three days is what the scripture meant. And, and he's resurrected. And that Sunday night, they see him when he's in the room with them. You know, it's amazing. Now, they didn't understand everything yet because they hadn't been given the gift of the Spirit, but they understood one thing. <clears throat> it's real because they saw him and they could touch him. And Thomas, you know, a week later, sees him and touches him. So they had this promise. What is the great promise? The great promise of John chapter 16 is no one <coughs> will take your joy from you. No one what? No one will take your joy from you. Uh, I think we need to stop and think about that line for just a minute. When the great apostle Peter, who tradition, historic, History, tradition, history teaches us that he was crucified as for his form of execution. But because he did not deem himself worthy to die like his Lord, do you know what he did? He said, turn me upside down. They crucified him on a cross upside down. You think that was joyful? Mm -hmm. But somehow it was. Joy doesn't have, we get joy confused with, with uh, pleasure and, and, you know, things like, joy isn't pleasure. Joy is an inner state of being. Joy is an inner state of being. There are countless records, historical writings and records of the early martyrs of the Christian church, those first few hundred years, when the Roman emperors were, were feeding them to lions, literally sawing some of them in half, boiling some of them in oil. There are letters of of people actually saying, you know what their final words were? Glory to God for all things. Glory to God for all things. Wow. They were joyful to be fed to the lions. They could have recanted their faith and not been fed to the lions. They could have stopped their martyrdom, but they didn't. Why? Because they had the joy of Jesus in them. And what was that joy? That they knew to die in this world meant to be born in the next. That they would be with Jesus. Because he promised them that. That's joy. And that's true for us today too. So I think we need to think about that. What I don't know, you know, Jesus says, uh, not here in, in this particular passage, but he is quoted as saying, in this world you have tribulation. That means trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. What is he saying? And so will you. And so will you. No one, hear me carefully, no one can take your joy away from you. If you are, if you are in this moment right here today, and I know some of us maybe have been sick, some of us don't feel good, some of us are having a rough time in life, you know, there are all kinds of circumstances can fill this room. Those are circumstances, okay? And they're real, and they hurt, and they're trials, and they're tribulations. But they do not have to steal your joy. No one can take your joy from you. You must surrender it. Okay? No one can take your joy from you. You have to give it to them. That's a psychological principle that we don't hear enough. So, what do we do with the words of Jesus here? Well, we look a little further here. 
as we go on, and in, in I think it's verse 23, Jesus transitions. He says, in that day, Verse 23, in that day, you will not ask, you will ask nothing of me. For truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask anything of the Father, he will give it to you in my name. Hitherto, which means up till now, hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be made full. Now, I don't have time to go into this section of Scripture, so we're going to stop there. We're going to pick up with this thought next time about how joy is made full by realizing we can ask anything in the Father's name, or in in Jesus' name, I'm sorry, in the Father. So that's a confusing thing to a lot of us, and that's understandable. Um, But we'll, we'll pick up with that section there. So for now, I think there's like five minutes till the top of the hour. Any... I know sometimes I do all the talking, and I apologize for that. This is a class. I want you to always interrupt me, always ask questions. Yes? I have a request. Nancy Global, she wanted us to pray for her because she's getting ready to go to surgery at 1230 at Wesley. Yes. Um, Sylvia is usually here, but Sylvia is with her at the hospital. So, yes, remember Nancy Global. Okay. Uh, what questions do you have about the lesson? Anyone? Any thoughts about this whole thing that you want to? Ask or want to talk about? Yeah. And in the creed, I notice it says, according to the scripture. Yes. The Nicene Creed. Yes, good, 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 good. But they didn't, they didn't have the New Testament scriptures. Good point. So, so what are they what, talking what, about? What were they, were they referencing the I'm Old gla- Testament? I'm glad you brought that up. They are referencing the Old Testament. And it may be in their mind they're thinking there's more <laughs> scriptures, but they're not authoritative yet because we haven't voted on them. But... But the clear word of God is the Old Testament. Okay, here's what I want you to hear. This is, this is weird for us evangelicals to hear this. When you get this through your mind, it's revolutionary. So I'm glad you brought that up. If tomorrow the government said, give me your New Testaments, rip them out of the book right now. No more New Testaments. We're going to squash this Jesus thing. Okay? And we didn't have New Testaments anymore. What would happen to the gospel? It would go on mightily. We don't have to have the New Testament. Because they didn't have Paul, Peter, James, John. None of them had it. And it says Paul, every town he went into to minister, he went first to the synagogues and he reasoned with them from the scriptures. He's talking about the, he shared Jesus from the Old Testament. Well, you and I need to learn how to share Jesus from the Old Testament. When you learn how to share Jesus from the Old Testament, now you're, now you got an apostolic ministry going here, okay? Because that's the original. A reason. That's a great point, Mark. That you you saw that. Because I didn't think to bring that out. Jesus is all through the Old Testament. You just got to know how to look for it. They know how to look for it. And if we're not reading up and studying that, you know, one of the things I told Pastor Mark Hamilton when he was here to preach, and he preached so long to us from the Old Testament, and I got to know Mark very well, and I said to him, I said, Pastor Mark, I love your Old Testament lessons, because he was bringing them forward into our lives and showing us how they're very valid and how it connects with Christ in the New Testament. Um, because we, we must do that. Too, too, many, too many generations of teachers and preachers have lost their training in Old Testament. Was, you know, I didn't grow up, no, I, I grew up thinking the Old Testament was just obsolete. That's the old. Now you got the new. No, really, truly, it's all one story. And the new reveals, the new reveals what the old has in shadows and types. So you've got to learn how to look for those shadows and types, and they're there. They're all through every book. Remember when Pastor Mark, where, was, it, was it his first week here, or when was it, the second week here, Pastor Mark Royer? Remember when he stood up and said, you know, Jesus is the so-and-so from the book of Genesis and the so-and-so from the book of Genesis. You remember that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go back and listen yeah. to that. Find that. That was great, wasn't it? He was, that's what he was doing. He was saying Jesus is all through the Old Testament. It's all one story. And he went all the way through Revelation. That was beautiful. Good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Right on the button. I bet that means it's, <laughs> it is 12 o'clock. 
Uh, well, let's, let's stop and pray. Thank you for your time today. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this class. And for all that are not able to be here today, I, I pray that you're with them, you bless them, bring them back again. But for those of us who are here and hearing this word, and those that will ever hear it on a podcast, Father, would you just, if there's something I said that's wrong, don't let anyone be misled. But Father, do open our hearts and minds. Breathe upon us. Help us to to see uh, the light of your word. Uh, reveal to us your truth, and uh, help us to help us to be drawn ever closer into the church, the body of Christ. I thank you for this time together, and ask your anointing upon it in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you, Father, and the Holy Spirit, as one God forever and ever, and unto the ages of ages. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen. This has been Forming the Spirit Within. I'm Roger Culver, inviting you to tune in next time as Pastor Brad opens God's Word, helping us to form the Holy Spirit within us. Until then, may grace and peace be with you.